And welcome back, part two of our tour of the 17-pounder M10 Achilles. Right, so I mentioned at the beginning of the first part that the mantlet showed a significant difference between the original 17-pounder M10 and this particular example. Well, the reason is because this is an ex-Israeli vehicle and the Israelis are never happy with anything they get. Modified it a little bit. So if you will imagine, if you will please, the gunner was originally located in a frankly quite cramped position on the left hand side of the turret while the Israelis moved him over onto the right. Instead of the gunner's sight, what they did was they placed a coaxial machine gun. Now again, remember, the original vehicle was a, or the British considered it a self-propelled anti-tank gun. There is no need for a machine gun. And the US Army didn't have any great need for one either. The only machine gun that they needed was Mardus, the caliber 50. This was a purely hand-cranked turret. There was a large wheel here, which was a very simple uh, cog system that you simply cranked very quickly in order to get the gun pointing whichever way you wanted it to point. Well, of course, now on the other side, the Israelis changed that as well, but we'll get that in a minute. The Lotus position is simple enough as befits the rest of this very simple vehicle. Uh, he has no turret platform. He also doesn't have a whole heck of a lot of room. The 17-pounder is a very big gun. And this is part of the reason why the Americans did not like Firefly. You imagine this big breach inside a Sherman turret didn't work out too well for him. He has six ready rounds available to him in the turret, three on the left turret wall and three on the rear. Also on the turret rear, we have the mounting point for the caliber 50 machine gun. Additional stowage for 17 pounder ammunition is found in the hull sponsons, stowed horizontally on both sides. So I've now come over to the gunner's position and there's a couple of points here. Firstly, it seems that my seating position is actually angled inwards a little bit. There's a little bucket for my feet to stop it from getting caught as the gun is traversed around. We can see one of the oil gear traverse systems looks just like that out of an M4 Sherman. Uh, so obviously this is power traverse. Now that said, there is no power traverse controller here. What there is, is there is a cable that runs back to the commander's position. It looks like the commander does the power traverse to slew onto a target, and then the gunner takes over with the hand cranks. Now, again, the original vehicle is going to be fairly simplistic. Uh, both the M10 and the 17-pounder version have a simple screw for elevating the gun. Large hand crank on his left-hand side here. Now, the original M10 had a gun depression of 10 degrees. The 17-pounder, five. And uh, I've measured it. I've taken this vehicle, put it all the way down to the bottom, gone with a quadrant. This is five degrees. Now, that said, there are some people who have seen photographs, and if you measure the photograph, it looks like 10 degrees for the 17-pounder. What's going on? Well, the best I've been able to find is that there is a removable stop on the elevation system that stops the gun from depressing more than five degrees. Um, I haven't found it myself, it's possible it is behind the canvas bag which sheathes the system from uh, debris and dirt. Now as for why the British did this, uh, I'm not entirely sure. My suspicion, however, is that the recoil of the 17-pounder was so much greater that you didn't want to have the additional upward impulse caused by the greater depression. So uh, my guess is that for safety or mechanical reasons, um, the gun depression has been limited in this, uh, in this vehicle. Now, some of the lads, especially the Brits on the EU forum, seem to think I have this issue against the 17-pounder. I don't. I have an issue against Firefly because of the huge gun in the small turret and the accompanying problems. I also have an issue with the SVDS ammo, which everybody talks about, hey, this is great ammunition. And true, on paper, if you hit something at point-blank range, it'll go through a very remarkable nine inches of armor. The problem was that it had to be pretty much a point-blank range. Uh, uh, repeated tests a couple of years apart by the US indicated that it was very inaccurate at any range, and uh, even British documentation from late 44 indicated the same thing. 
And uh, at this time of writing, uh, although we all agree that the British did fix the accuracy problems with the 17-pounder Sabre eventually, uh, there is some dispute as to when exactly they did it. Uh, anything I can find indicates this was sometime after the war. The first actual solution was uh, the Canadians with their pot Sabre in about 1946. Now, that said, this gun fired more than just Sabo. Uh, obviously, there was, especially by the end of the war, a very useful HE round, uh, reduced charge as well, so it was nice and slow. You can see the tracer on that very easily. The other ammunition was your standard APCBC round, which punched through a still very respectable 7.5 inches of metal at 30 degrees and was reasonably accurate. As a result, it is probably fair to say that the Achilles 17-pounder was quite probably the best self-propelled anti-tank gun of the war, at least until the M36 Jackson came along. Of the various types of ammunition the gun had available to him, there were about 50 rounds stood around the vehicle from the choose from. Back to the operation of the gun itself, and to its front would be usually a number 43 telescope, it's a, a by 3 optic. Uh, it, it was possible to find also a panoramic telescope that at least the commander could use as well. There is an azimuth indicator on his right. Uh, as mentioned, the control handles for the elevation and traverse, they are extremely close together. Not ideal, but uh, again, if you have the power traverse from the commander's override working, he's only going to be doing fine lays, so I guess he's going to, have, he's going to be able to live with it. Moving to the gun itself, we have the travel lock for the 17-pounder. fits into here. It actually never removed the original travel lock for the 3 inch or just further forward inside the turret, but I guess it's not in anybody's way. Firing system. Uh, simplicity itself. It's a lanyard. Uh, dangles down through here, connects onto this. You pull down, this lever comes up, this moves. Uh, this bar over here sets off the firing pin. The safety is ingenious. It is simply a push rod that it is currently in the safe position. The rod connects to here and prevents the lever from moving. All you do to come to fire is you pull it out, rotate it to the side, and now the lever is free to move up or down. Or at least it would be if it wasn't basically rusted in position. The breech, vertically sliding, and the recoil guard is huge. Um, basically, in order to get from one side of the vehicle to the other, you gotta climb over it. Uh, it also does kind of cramp the commander and loader a little bit as well. So this is pretty much the engagement position for the gunner. And my head is at an angle. My left elbow is hard in to, to clear the gun. And my right hand is kind of interfering with my knees as I rotate the traverse handle. So this shows how cramped I am if I have my head down into position uh, to look through the sight. And you can see that the uh, elevation hand wheel actually doesn't provide clearance against the traverse hand wheel, which is a little bit of a nuisance. Get it out of the way a little bit, and I'm still a little tight, but I guess the trick is you, you better hope that the correct elevation for hitting a target does not require any more traverse. It's not a great position on the Israeli modification. Now, if I was to come back a little bit and think about what it would be like with uh, an original uh, hand crank traverse uh, with the big wheel, there's not much room for that either. Um, crew efficiency, not ideal on this vehicle. One last thing while I'm here about the counterweights and traversing. Now, the original gun was only of a certain length, much shorter than that of the 17-pounder. Because of the way the 17-pounder is mounted on the trunnions, they needed to add an additional counterweight on the far end of the gun, right behind the muzzle brake, in order to make it easier for the gunner to elevate and depress the gun. The catch is this has now made the turret even more front-heavy than it would have been without the additional counterweight on the end. I mean, the gun is heavy enough as it is. So this does not bode well, I don't think, for the concept of traversing when the vehicle is not on relatively level ground. Unfortunately, I don't have unlevel ground that I can put this onto uh, to test it for myself. And I haven't actually seen any reports specifically addressing the issue one way or the other. So this is speculation on my part. A 
commander's position on this vehicle is located right rear. He's got the typical round seat. Um, although I do note that it's perfectly placed together with the rim of the turret that I, I can just relax and it's simply resting um, my leg upon the seat. So I'm actually kind of comfortable up here. Uh, bearing in mind also, this is an open top vehicle. The, you know, the whole point of the tank destroyers where you're going to see the enemy first and then shoot them first. And of course, historically, whoever shot first tended to win uh, you know, for probably a couple of reasons, but that's the bottom line. If you see the enemy first, shoot the enemy first, you're probably going to come out the better for the deal. So he would have in the Israeli modification, the commander's override would be here. Uh, he has the caliber 50 to its rear, uh, the American version at least, or 300 rounds of caliber 50 ammunition available to him. Uh, there was an intercom system, it was the only electric uh, component above the turret ring in the original vehicles. Uh, obviously with the addition of the power traverse that has changed a little bit. Nothing much else for him to do here. He's got a great view of the crew, great view of the world around him and uh, a nice big recoil guard to protect his legs. That's it for the turret, now we move forward. Right, those contortions were because the, the gun mantlet was directly over the uh, driver's hatch, um, which as mentioned earlier, you can't open or close the hatch if the, if the gun is to the front at all. So, that said, the seat backs do fold, so it's much easier uh, to come in and out probably through the turret, especially since there is no basket at all. So there's nothing interfering unless the gun just happens to be at that one angle directly behind your access point. So moving in, the seat does come up and down. Simply enough. So the driver's position is gonna be our last one here because the assistant driver uh, has absolutely nothing to do. Uh, the radio would be mounted in the sponson to his right, but he has no driver's controls. He obviously has no home machine gun. He's pretty much along for the ride. Uh, he does have the periscope to his front that he can look around and help uh, spot threats. Uh, he also has the escape hatch, uh, which is down behind him should he need it. Driver's position, pretty much what you would expect for a Sherman type vehicle. Steering, done of course by use of the titters, they also serve as your brake. Uh, it is fixed radius steering, so five feet would be the absolute minimum in first gear and top gear it's 26 feet. Speaking of gears, clutch pedal to the left, transmission on the right, it's uh, five speed synchronized. Uh, first gear tops out at a whopping two miles an hour, and by the time you hit 17, you wanna be in fifth. So that gives you an idea of the uh, spread range. Speaking of clutches, we have the two clutches uh, for the two engines as opposed to the clutch for the transmission. And uh, you can engage or disengage them by depressing the clutch pedal and then pulling one lever or the other out as required. Accelerator. Uh, there is the accelerator and the hand throttle. The accelerator, of course, is the pedal on the floor. Uh, the operator's manual is quite basic on how to use it to drive forward depressed pedal. Um, I guess it's probably worth noting back then, not everybody had cars, especially if you're maybe an inner city boy. Uh, the hand throttle, out is more gas, in less gas, and uh, yeah, sometimes when I hop into one of these vehicles, the, the diagram in the manual doesn't match up what I'm expecting, but this one I know is true, because if I depress the accelerator, you see the hand throttle come up. Controls to his left, the typical uh, panel, you would have seen something very similar to this with the M4A2 had you looked inside one. Uh, so obviously we have the panel lights, uh, electricity, it's got two sets of oil pressure, obviously one for each engine, temperature, fuel, you would select which tank you want to look at with your selector. The manual does recommend that you use one fuel tank to dry 
before you switch over to the other. So I don't know if that was just a case of making the, the refueling operation simpler, but that, that's the way the manual says. Speedometer, two tachometers, one for each engine. Starter buttons, one for each engine. These would be the main lights. Blackout marker, blackout drive. Stop lights only, and full headlights. Also, this is a toggle to select which engine's temperature you wanted to read. They are circuit breakers. And finally, we have a, a warning light there for water and, or low oil pressure. To get going, you start off with, of course, master power in this traditional position over the left shoulder. Lock out two engine clutches. Depress the accelerator halfway, bring it back to idle. You're now looking for the pressure warning lights. If all is good, go ahead and start one engine using the starter. Once that is up and running, then start the other engine. Let it warm up a bit, depress the clutch pedal, put the engines into gear, and of course you're still in neutral. Release the clutch pedal, your transmission is now connected, and you can drive on. It is possible to start one engine with the other. Let's say your starter motor is gone or it's a really, really cold day, you want to save on the battery. And once you have the first engine running, go ahead and with your clutch pedal depressed, put both of the engines back into connection with the transmission by use of the individual clutches. Give it a bit of gas, let go of the clutch, and the one engine was now mechanically connected to the other. It should start up, of course, compression system, no electricity required. Outside of that, nothing really in here. The transmission takes up a fair bit of space to his right, but that's pretty much standard. Uh, he does have a headrest to protect his head from falling back too much. There is cushioning above him as well, so he doesn't hurt his head. Uh, usually the driver is just gonna be wearing the soft plastic helmet but uh, that's plenty enough to stop you from getting the knocks and bangs. Uh, the position is comfortable for somebody who is shorter than I am. Uh, I can drive this, which is saying something compared to some other vehicles that I've been in the past. And uh, again, I'm gonna digress a little bit. I say, yes, I'm taller than most. My thinking is, if I am re if I'm comfortable in a tank, that means that shorter people are really comfortable. They have a lot of room to work. They're gonna be very efficient. If I am uncomfortable, but can still operate it, then shorter people will probably be okay. And if I can't operate it at all, even if shorter people can operate it, then it is probably still going to be a little bit cramped, a little uncomfortable, and they will be less efficient. Right, and we are done in here. Now, I am not going to attempt to extricate myself again uh, through the main door. They're actually called doors, not hatches in the manual. Instead, I'm going to take advantage of the fact that there's no terror basket and get out the easy way. So that's about it. 1,648 M10s were sent to the British, and about two-thirds of them were converted to 17-pounder. They were used in troops of usually four guns, and themselves in mixed batteries in anti-tank regiments. A battery would consist of mixed vehicles, so you could have a troop of self-propelled M10s, a troop of towed 17-pounders, and a troop of towed 6-pounders, all in the same battery. All these vehicles were manned by Royal Artillery personnel, not tankers. The difference between British anti-tank doctrine and the US tank destroyer concept is that uh, although the Royal Artillery considered them anti-tank guns, they were not held purely in reserve. American tank destroyers were entirely reactionary force. However, the British would be a little bit more aggressive with their guns, for example, sighting them further forward uh, and along an expected enemy avenue of attack the Americans would be more held to the rear in order to respond en masse to whatever came up. Now at the core level, however, the British anti-tank artillery did function very similarly to the tank destroyer concept. It seems to be more a matter of detail. Uh, they were, in effect, the Corps' fire brigade. And that's it. Hope you enjoyed your tour of the Achilles. We'll see you on the next one.